Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This time we're continuing with the topic of pragmatics, and specifically we'll take a look at conversation, language in action, if you like. Right, before we do that, let me briefly review what happened last time. So last time I talked about the code model of conversation, the idea that there is a speaker who has a thought, and then encodes that thought into a message yeah, using a code, a language. And the message is sent out to a hearer, and the hearer has the same code so they can decode that message and um, translate bits of sound into bits of thought. And they arrive at the same idea, the same thought that the speaker initially had. Okay. Um, I pointed out that there are certain problems associated with this model. And the first problem is that the code model disregards context. It's context-free. That's problematic. And the second problem is that it disregards the activity of inferencing, okay, the active meaning-constructing part that the hearer accomplishes. Right. In that context, I invited you to distinguish between what is said, the locution of an utterance, yeah, what's there in the words, what do the words themselves mean, and what is meant by an utterance, what do you mean by X. And just to give you another example to illustrate this distinction, imagine that you have a friend and they're telling you, John is ready. Yeah, John is ready. That can mean very different things. It can mean that John is now ready to go to bed. It could mean that John is now ready to go to the cinema. It could mean that um, John has now finished his PhD, something along those lines. And suppose you know several people with the name of John. Well, um, any of those could be meant. So what is said, locution, what is meant, the illocution. Then I distinguished several types of speech act, commissive speech act, where you make a promise, take a vow, um, verdictive speech acts when you sentence somebody or uh, you give something a five-star review, representative speech acts when uh, you make a statement like Paris is the capital of France or you say something like um, <clears throat> this cheese cost me 20 francs. Um, expressive speech acts are saying things like thank you or maybe less polite things um, along the same lines and um, directive speech acts are things like ordering a meal in a restaurant or asking for directions or um, <clears throat> simply you know asking somebody for the time things like that and then there are declarative speech acts, pronouncing someone husband and husband, or um, pronouncing somebody the next pope. I can't do that. You can't either. But there are people who can. Good for them. Right. Another topic that I discussed was the so-called cooperative principle. And subordinate to that principle, there, is, there are four conversational maxims little directives, little voices in your head that tell you how to behave when you talk. Yeah. Um, so the cooperative principle is really just, you know, be rational about conversing, speak in such a way that everybody else understands you so that the whole thing makes sense. Yeah, you know, a kind of social contract. And uh, the social contract consists of several maxims that interact. For instance, the maxim of quantity, don't say more than is necessary, but say enough so that you're understood. The maxim of relevance, say something that belongs to the current situation, that uh, makes sense with regard to what's been said before. Manner, be orderly, say things, present things in the way that they've actually happened in the real world. And quality, don't lie, only say what you believe to be true. Right. These are the maxims. And I also pointed out that you can flout those maxims. You can violate them, not disregard them. You, you violate them when you make clear to the hearer that right now you are, in fact, 
violating them. Okay. Uh, so as long as you, you can say things that are wrong and not true, but at the same time you're giving a signal to the hearer that okay, what I'm saying now it's not exactly true. Okay, and through that they'll be able to figure out that okay, you must mean something else. <laughs> okay. Now let's put all that behind us for a second and let's look at conversation. Why look at conversation? Um, what is conversation to begin with? We can define it as informal talk between two or more people. The kind of stuff that goes on when people meet. People like to talk. Yeah? Have you noticed? They, they talk a lot. Um, it's the most frequent and widespread type of language use. It's an everyday experience. And um, the thing that makes it interesting for linguists is that conversation is way, way more basic than any other speech event. It's more basic than a university lecture. It's more basic than, say, a telephone call. Um, it's more basic than um, writing, of course. So it's the real deal, in other words. It's what we learn first. It's how kids learn language. Everybody on earth knows how to hold a conversation. Not everybody knows how to write. Um, so it's the most basic thing. It's what linguists should be studying, really. Now, um, a catchphrase for this would be, conversation is language in its natural habitat, and writing is just a form of domesticated language. <laughs> um, studying conversation demands close attention to the context. You can see, spoken language in conversation is much more context dependent than, say, language on the page of a book. Yeah, it's uh, a different kind of thing. There is the physical environment, things that are present in the actual speech situation <clears throat> that influence how I talk to you about these things. The participants, of course, make a difference. Uh, we're talking about characteristics of individual language users. Everybody uses language a little differently. The social setting plays a role. What kind of relation is there between the talkers? Do they know each other? Are they friends? Are they in any sort of power? relationship so do we have one who maybe is the child and the other one is the parent or do we have one who is the boss and one who is the employee do we have one who's trying to buy a pound of cheese and the other one is trying to sell a pound of cheese these kinds of things prior discourse that's also part of the context we might call this the linguistic context the stuff that the talkers already talked about yeah so they know, well, you and I, we have talked about John and something that has happened to John. He has lost his wallet recently. And uh, so you know that I know that, okay, John, we, we know John. We know that he always does clumsy things. This kind of stuff. That's the common ground of the participants. And that has an effect on uh, how we talk about John and the things that he does. Cultural norms and expectations. Uh, what conventions of interaction are there in your culture? Last time I mentioned the example of me at Helsinki Airport um, expecting things that apparently are not part of the local culture and uh, learning something in the process, yes. Um, all right, so conversation, that's what it is. It's highly context dependent. How then should we study it? You notice that you can't really study conversation just sitting in your swivel chair and thinking about conversation. Nah, only gets you so far. You have to look at authentic data, at people talking, in order to be able to say something about conversation. Your intuitions only go that far. So, um, linguists use something that's called a corpus, that is a large collection of natural data. And one example for a corpus that I would like to present here in this video is the Santa Barbara Corpus of Spoken American English. Um, so, this corpus consists of recordings and transcriptions of those recordings, um, representing language in different social settings. 
typically friends talking with one another, but also you know, service encounters, uh, public lectures, that sort of thing. And if you look at what people are doing when you leave them to your their own devices, then that's what actually gives you a kind of grammar of natural conversation, the regularities that you see in natural conversation. Yeah, so you have these recordings, meaning that you can do an acoustic analysis of that material. You can also use it as a historical record of how people talked at a certain time in history. And most importantly, you can study language as a kind of social behavior. So in a way, you're not too unlike uh, you know, biologists going out into the jungle and filming lions and, and gazelles and whatnot. And mm, you're observing social behavior of those animals yeah and you're trying to understand okay what is the social organization of of these species yeah. and of course human beings there are a lot of things that um well it's, it's complex stuff ordinary life is very complex stuff so i brought you a little example of spoken language and uh it's called appease the monster um and it takes place at a birthday party in the U.S. state of Indiana. Um, and the, the people talking, you see, they're in their mid-twenties, so about your age. And, um, well, no, you're younger than that, right? So uh, younger than me, older than you, for the most part. And uh, they know each other fairly well, okay? So we have um, brother and sister with their parents and uh, here's the text and I'll play this to you and I would like you to read along okay here we go I hope the sound is okay uh, you know, I, saw her I saw her at Diamond Gems oh yeah what's she, she doing? With the baby? is she working yet or still at home? I don't think she's still at home she doesn't have to she doesn't have to unless you know, I guess God's making some good vibes. Yeah, but they bought like three cars in a row. She had that one, and they sold that. And bought yeah, but at that others. point, she was still on an in unending money streak. Because of the policy she took out on her husband. Well, yeah, but has that finished? finished? That hasn't finished. Yeah, it finished it? when she got married to Todd. Oh, really? They gave her like a thirty-something lump sum. Thirty thousand. Oh, it was supposed to pay like continuously until yeah. forever, for the rest of her life, or until she got married again. She must have loved him pretty much. Kevin, <laughs> you're morbid. How much is your life insurance for? <laughs> Cost me seventeen dollars every three months. I'm not sure. Don't ask much out of that. What do we don't know will hurt you. What are we doing here? Okay, yeah, uh, so you see it's um, people at a birthday party talking about people dying and then um, receiving payments from a life insurance and whatnot. So, what things can we observe in this kind of behavior? Um, let me point out to you a few structural things that we can find in data of this kind. Um, one thing that's very, very important is called the turn-taking system. Turn-taking meaning uh, how do you get your turn in speech. Yeah? Everybody wants to make a contribution. Uh, how do we organize that? Well, it organizes itself. And uh, <clears throat> um, well, I'll say more about this. First things first. Um, the basic unit of spoken discourse, that is the turn. Um, or the turn construction unit, as it's sometimes called. And uh, speakers take turns at talking. So there are times in which one speaker talks and talks and talks and talks, then another speaker talks and talks and talks and talks. And um, so this is a back and forth between different participants. And there is a certain time during the turn construction unit in which the speaker holds the floor. That's an expression, okay? You hold the floor, you, um, it's, it's your turn to speak right there and then. Now the question is how do speakers get the floor? How do they get to make their turn? And there are two principal processes for this. One is 
other selection and one is self selection okay in other selection it's some other speaker that singles out a speaker to have the next turn and in self selection it is yourself you come forward and um, express interest in having the next turn let's look at this in uh, the data that we have here so if you want to you can um, maybe um, tell you what let's listen to this again and you can maybe find um, instances of other selection and self-selection. I'll play this one more time. Uh -huh. Oh, you watched Horror Scar Show? I saw her at Diamond Gems. Oh, yeah? What's she, she doing? Is she working yet or still at home? I don't think she's still at home. She doesn't have to work, does she? She didn't have to unless, you know, I guess God's making some good vibes. Yeah, but they bought like three cars in a row. She had that one and they sold that. And bought yeah, but at that others. point she was still on an in unending money streak. The policy she took out on her husband. Her husband well, yeah, but has that finished? Finish? That hasn't finished. Yeah, finished it? when she got married to Todd. Oh, really? They gave her like a thirty-something lump sum, thirty thousand. Oh, it was supposed to pay like continuously until uh, forever, for the rest of her life, or until she got married again. She must love him pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> you're a Mormon. How much is your life insurance for? <laughs> Cost me seventeen dollars every three months. I'm not sure. Don't ask much out of that one. What you window. don't know will hurt you. What are we doing here? Right. Okay. So, um, other selection and self selection. One instance of other selection is here, where Wendy asks, "How much is your life insurance worth?" You know, asking um, Kevin, who just made a cruel joke about um know how this other person um you know must must have loved the, the the new husband very much in order to forego the payments of the life insurance so that's other selection and there's also self-selection um so at this point up there marcy is asking what's she doing is she working yet or still at home Okay, nobody asked her to, to make this contribution, but she's interested in this. And so she's speaking up when there is an opportunity. Okay. <clears throat> turn-taking. Um, an important part of this turn-taking is that as a hearer and future speaker, as a hopeful speaker, you have to be able to identify positions in talk when you are likely to get a word in. You know, this gets so difficult when there's several people talking. I, you know, I have difficulties. Uh, but, you know, you learn how to do this. What are the cues to people's ends of turns? Um, there are several indicators, for instance, falling intonation, um, but also non-linguistic stuff like eye gaze or body movement. Um, pauses, of course, also... Um, can serve as an indicator that somebody has finished their turn. But there's cultural variability, yeah? So that pauses of a certain length may be interpreted as ends of turns in one culture, but they're not really ends of turns. It's just that the speaker is pausing for emphasis or um, just, you know, people pause when they have processing difficulties. Watch my videos, you'll, you'll see that a lot. Um, so. There you have it, falling intonation, um, eye gaze or body movement, and pauses. And um, another cue might be if uh, you're selected as, as the next speaker. When somebody asks a question, okay, that is a very unambiguous cue that <clears throat> uh, somebody's turn has come to an end. Okay, moving on to another concept here, overlap people talking at the same time. Now, in this excerpt, in this text, you notice that there is a good amount of overlap there, yeah? But it is principled. So, um, 
it's not that speakers are overlapping all the time. It is only at certain points in conversation. And uh, th there are different reasons for overlap. First of all, there may be just timing problems, so that a speaker misprojects the end of a turn and starts speaking too soon. Yeah. Um, there could also be interruption. So that's the first is non-deliberate, but the second is deliberate overlap. The speaker is starting to speak before the other is done in order to silence that other person. Yeah, so you're in a way you're insisting insisting on it's my turn now, now I want to speak. Um, a very frequent case of overlap though is what's called back channeling. Back channeling is that somebody goes, uh-huh, yeah. Well that's interesting. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, so these things happen simultaneously to the other person um, taking their turn. And they're not a signal that you want to speak. They're rather a signal, okay, I'm here, I'm listening, keep talking. Yeah. So somebody is speaking without intending to take the floor. Um, we see several cases of overlap here in the transcripts. Yeah. Um, I saw her at Scott's the other day. Yeah. So I saw her at Scott's the other day. Uh, the other day is simultaneously uh, spoken to, we saw her at Diamond Gyms, okay? So Kendra is finishing her turn and Wendy is already jumping in a little too fast. Maybe because she interpreted Scott's as the end of uh, Kendra's turn. <clears throat> so um, here we have Wendy saying, I don't think she's, and Kendra goes, I think she's still at home. Yeah, so they're both trying to answer um, Marcy's question there. So that is a bit of non-deliberate, but uh, yeah, uh, they're both trying to answer the question. And as uh, soon as uh, Kendra is done, she lets Wendy elaborate on her longer answer. Okay, overlap. What else is there? Yeah, let me t return to these back channel responses for a minute. Um, they are not an attempt to gain the floor. Rather, they signal that the hearer is paying attention in forms like mm hmm, right, yeah, uh huh. And um, these are directed towards the holder of the current turn. And they are also different uh, in function, though not necessarily in structure from continuation signals. So when you hear me talking, you, you hear all those ums and uhs and well, um, those are continuation signals produced by a speaker in the middle of a turn, used as a device to hold the floor and to gain time and to signal to the hearer, okay, okay, I'm not saying anything useful at this moment, but I'm thinking hard and I may be saying it in just a second. And there you have it. So those are those ums and uhs. They look like speech deficiencies, right? They look like junk. But really, they're not junk. They're doing something functional. They're presenting the message to the hearer that uh, the, the speaker is currently experiencing some processing difficulties and will be back online shortly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is fun. Right, uh, so here we have some some back channeling stuff. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So invitation to keep talking. Tell me more. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh really? Stuff like that. Useful. I suggest to you, you know, if you're up for an experiment, try to refrain from using any back channel responses for one day. But um, see, I don't don't hold your linguistics instructor responsible for any consequences that this might have, because I have the feeling that some people might get really angry at you if you don't do these back channel responses. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Another concept that is crucial for the analysis of conversation is the concept of adjacency pairs. Adjacency pairs, well, you have a pair, and the pair is adjacent, that is, they directly um, contiguous, they're, you know, one first and then the next, they're adjacent. Um, so adjacency pairs 
that's a pair of turns produced by two speakers, not just one. Um, and the first turn projects or calls for the second part of the adjacency pair, a response. So adjacency pairs are things like question and answer, or invitation and acceptance, or opening sequence, hello, this is Martin, uh, and a response, oh, hi, how are you doing? Um, assessment and agreement, ah, oh, that's terrible. I know, it's terrible. Um, assessment and disagreement, oh, that's terrible. I thought it wasn't so bad. Uh, request and compliance, could you please hold this for me? Yeah, sure. Uh, and a pre-closing sequence and a closing response. So, yeah, I, I really have to go now. Um, sorry? No, okay. I'll stay. Yeah, adjacency pairs. There are different types of adjacency pairs uh, in terms of their structure. They can be contiguous, so you have the first part directly followed by the second part. They can be ordered and they can be matched um, so that you have these insertion sequences within uh, an adjacency pair within um, an adjacency pair. Yeah. Um, so person A says, where's the milk that I bought this morning? B asks, the skim milk? A says, yeah. And B then provides the response uh, to the first question. Okay, so where's the milk I bought this morning? On the counter, only after a second adjacency pair has been, um, has been uh, completed. Right. There are certain adjacency pairs in this transcript, yeah. Um, so Marcy is asking, what's she doing? Is she working yet or still at home? And then Wendy and Kendra are providing the response. I don't think she's, and then when Kendra says, I think she's still at home. Okay, so question and answer. Um, same thing here, does, she doesn't have to work, does she? Uh, and Kendra says, she doesn't have to, unless you know, I guess Scott's making some good bucks. <clears throat> from questions and answers to um, preferred and dispreferred responses. Uh, adjacency pairs have answers that you like to get and answers that you don't really like to get that much. Um, consider this example to person A saying, I really liked the movie last night, what did you think of it? And of course what the person wants is some uh, confirmation along the lines of, yeah, it was really good, I liked it. Um, but sometimes person B will say, well, I'm really not that much into sci-fi and I thought the effects were crap. And mm -hmm. So notice that here in the second case where you have a dispreferred response, you're actually getting an indirect speech act as a response. Um, so person B does not say, I hated that movie, uh, but what they say is, I'm not that much into sci-fi and, of course, the hearer is asked to infer that, um, okay, that's an explanation for why person B might not have liked the movie. Yeah, so this preferred response is typically indirect speech. Can you come to my party tomorrow? Ah, oh, sorry, I have this thing that I need to finish. You get it. Coming to the next notion here, uh, repair. Repair is trying to fix something that was said. And in spoken conversation, there's a need for fixing something that was said more often than not. Yeah? <clears throat> repair can be either self-initiated, so that the speaker themselves are noticing, oh, that, that didn't come out right, I, wait, I need to start over. Uh, okay, here it is. But it can also be other initiated when the other person says, huh, what was that? <clears throat> a false start. People who are beginning a sentence and then breaking it off and going, ah, no, 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 this is what it is. That's also a kind of repair. Yeah, self-initiated repair. Let's see. There are some examples of repair in uh, the transcript. Yeah. Take, for instance, this 
turn by Kendra here. Yeah, at that point she was still on an unending money streak because of the policy she took out on her husband. Ex-husband. Well, deceased husband. <laughs> yeah. So um, Kendra is looking for the right word. And the first solution, her husband, doesn't really like that. Ex-husband, yeah, okay, that's a little better, but still not quite there yet. Deceased husband, okay, that's what it really is. Sad story. Um, but it illustrates self-repair. So it can do a greater good in the universe. Next point, co-construction. Co-construction describes an event where one speaker begins an utterance and a second speaker completes it. <clears throat> and also this happens to me a lot because I'm often finding myself in situations like this. Um, so I, I tell my wife, I'm looking for this. And then I do a gesture and she's a pencil sharpener. And then, yes, pencil sharpener, thanks. Um, or imagine person B saying, gee, these mosquitoes, they are... Uh, and person B commiserates and say, yeah, they're a pain in the neck, absolutely. So person B finishing person A's sentence. It's really remarkable how good people are at doing this. And what this shows is that as you hear something, as you hear your interlocutor talk to you, you are actually analyzing what they're saying and you're computing the probabilities of words that come up next. So mm, you are actively monitoring what the other person is saying. And this goes so fast that you're actually able to finish other people's sentences when they themselves have certain processing difficulties. That is really a marvel to my mind. Um, let's see, I have two examples of co-construction or one example of co-construction here in the transcript. So, uh, Wendy says, oh, it was supposed to pay like continuously until, and Kendra says, forever, for the rest of her life, or until she got married again. So, Kendra, you notice that we can construct a whole sentence out of this. Uh, we can take Wendy's, it was supposed to pay for the rest of her life, or until she got married again. Yeah, so, Wendy provides the first part of the sentence, Kendra provides the second part, co-construction, constructing something together. Right, it's time that we talk about politeness. Politeness, that's always important. Um, there are two types of politeness, linguistic politeness, and a distinction that is made is between negative politeness and positive politeness. Now you might wonder, how can politeness ever be negative? It's always nice to be nice. Um, well, it's a technical term, so what's negative politeness? It is when you want something from another person and you want to make this speech act where you want another person to do something or give you something or tell you something or get out of the way. Um, make that speech act less of an infringement on that person's, you know, aura, whatever you want to call it. So you're respecting a person's desire to be left alone, undisturbed, uncontradicted with. Um, and so you say things like, sorry, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm really sorry to bother you. I wanted to ask you if, um, well, when you're contradicting, yeah, I, 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 t I totally see your point. However, mm, okay, that's negative politeness. Politeness. Um, leaving other person's sphere intact. Positive politeness, on the other hand, is the active establishment of positive relationships with another person. So uh, a person does not only have the desire to be left alone and to be uncontradicted, it, uh, a person also needs to be liked and understood and cared for and loved and whatnot. So positive politeness, those are things like compliments, or, um, funnily enough, also things like swearing. Hmm? Um, because if you use foul language, what you're actually signaling to the person is that you and I, we are so close. We don't have to bother with these social conventions. You know, we, we're 
we're actually friends. So, um, compliments in group language, swearing, that's positive politeness. That is, yeah, scratching the other person's back. Yeah? Negative politeness is not messing with the other person too much. Yeah, uh, this might already be the final concept that I want to discuss, cohesion. Um, utterances are linked together in different ways. Um, natural conversation has a flow, yeah, a topical flow, so that certain things follow other things naturally. And so texts, yeah, spoken conversation, that's also a text, um, consist of utterances that are linked together in different ways. And ways to link utterances are things like uh, deictic elements, uh, pronouns, proforms, in uh, sequences like I called Bob yesterday, he said he was busy. Okay, so he in the second sentence refers back to Bob in the first. Um, I grew up in the, no, I, I didn't, but you know, I grew up in the 70s, says this example. Back then, all the guys had long hair. Uh, I always wanted to buy a Harley, but I never did, the proverb did, um, refers back to buying a Harley. So deictic elements, one way to establish cohesion. Conjunction, that's another way to establish cohesion. Uh, conjunctions link sentences by establishing a semantic relation between them. That semantic relation can be one of cause, one of addition, one of temporal relation, so that, you know, this happened first, this happened then. Um, as in, he's not coming because he is sick. So I present you with the information, he's not coming, and he is sick, and the not coming is because he is sick. Right, and then there's lexical cohesion. Uh, when you use synonyms or um, words that are really... Um, yeah, uh, partonyms or holonyms, meronyms. Uh, we talked about meronyms earlier in semantics one, I think. So I can say something like my car's in the shop, something is wrong with the brakes. Yeah, so a part of the second sentence refers back to an idea that I already presented in the first sentence. Right, what do we have left? Okay, so here's an example of cohesion at work in the uh, text, yeah, they, they bought like three cars in a row, so the idea of cars is active. She had that one, referring back to a car, through a pronominal element, and they sold that and bought two others. So these three sentences are all about cars, but the, the, the word car is not in there. It's like the word car was mentioned here, and it's prominent enough so that we can refer back to uh, this idea using a pronoun, cohesion in text. And that brings me to the last idea for today, namely given a new information. Next time the video will be all about given a new, nearly. Um, so here's an introduction to that. Given a new information, as a conversation progresses, new information is introduced. Yeah, we don't just talk about the old stuff although that might very well be the impression, uh, new ideas enter the conversation all the time. So there's old information that linguists call given information. That is information that the speaker assumes to be known or at least accessible, inferable at a certain moment in time. Uh, it can be either common knowledge, the idea that there is gravity or that there is a road leading from Neuchâtel to Lausanne, or it can be part of a previous discourse, you know, we talked about John and he lost his wallet and all that, or it can be about the context, it can be that, okay, we're in the university building and you know, if you walk out that door behind me, um, you're in the hallway and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, given information in linguistic utterances is often placed early in a sentence. Um, and it often re receives a low amount of stress. And it's often expressed through deictic elements. And why is that? Well, it's because it's something that you already know. Okay, so I'm giving you this to you know, present a piece of given information 
that you can hook on to, and then I say something new about it. So new information is information that the hero cannot know at this point, or cannot just infer, um, and it's often placed late in a sentence and spoken with stress, and often expressed through full lexical forms. This is an important idea that I will let sink in a little bit, and as I said, next time we'll talk in more detail about this. Yeah. Um, so, looking at text. Yeah. Um, so in Kendra's take here, uh, but at that point she was still on an unending money streak. So, but at that point, that refers. That's also given information that refer, uh, refers to a time that the participants already talked about. She, yeah, that is. Um, who are they talking about? We don't even know the name. Um, but uh, it's already phenomenal up here. I saw her at Scott's the other day. So that's given information. And now Kendra says something new about her name, that she was on an unending money streak. She was receiving money week by week. So that's new information. And uh, when Marcy replies to that, she can refer to this unending money streak with a pronoun, that. So that is given information. And she asks something new about this, namely whether that has finished. And you see that finished is at the end of her utterance. So as a tendency, given information tends to precede new information. There are exceptions, of course, and uh, we'll need to talk about these exceptions because they're systematic and you can actually explain what's going on there. Okay, I want to leave it at that for this video. Um, yeah, um, looking at conversation, it's a whole business of its own. And um, I hope that uh, you find it just as fascinating as I do. And I'll see you next week.